speak with you again. Um, I, I need to really talk with you guys straight from the heart and uh, uh, a couple of things that I'm wanting to share with you. I need to, I'm trying to get here to my uh, YouTube channel where you'll be watching this at. Uh, a video that I did the other on, on May 27th called God's Way of Revealing Himself has really brought a tremendous amount of controversy, not so much from the main body of viewers, uh, but there were a couple of brothers that are dear to me that took offense to the video that I made. In fact, on this particular video, I had never before uh, made a video where I had taken and actually asked a couple of brothers to review it before releasing it, uh, mainly because I didn't want to cause an offense. Uh, so let me just state one thing before we get started here tonight. And by the way, what I'm going to be talking to you tonight, the, this video here is only part of it. I'm actually going to take you into a teaching about the Holy Spirit and the fall in the Garden of Eden. I know it seems kind of awkward, the two of those together, but we're going to get into that very soon. And, of course, this video here that I did the other day has a lot to do with the reason why I'm going into that subject as well. But let me just state for the, for the record here, uh, and I'm only going to, the reason why I'm going to state the names here is because uh, in, in the comments that were posted on the video, uh, it was quite evident that it was Brother Matthew and Brother Chris uh, that I upset and uh, because both of these brothers are code searchers. They, they research Bible codes. And you have to understand that at one time I was very, very much favorable for Bible codes. And I still believe that God, in some way or fashion, has hidden things in the Bible codes. Uh, my concern came, though, and not because of these two brothers here, but as God began to deal with me, and this has actually kind of gone back a little ways before this particular video, when God was dealing with me about dreams and visions, because especially last year, and even in 2012, so many dreams that people were having predicting uh, the rapture, the, the great uh, earthquakes, the splitting of the, uh, of the United States, things like that, and dates and times were being set as a result. And nothing actually ever happened, nothing came to fruition. And so I'd done a video a little while back specifically about dreams, even before these things came to pass, or did not come to pass in this case here, trying to warn the people about being cautious how we interpret the dreams and the visions that we have, or whether or not we should give them... Uh, uh, in other words, you don't want to up and just say it's prophetic and it's from the Lord unless you know for a fact it comes from the Lord. Because when it doesn't come to pass, it puts yourself in a position to where if we took it during the times of Moses, you would be taken out and stoned for prophesying, as a, prophesying a lie. It was just that serious of an offense. And right before I did this video here, God's way of revealing himself, the Lord really had begun to deal with me on the use of Bible codes and as well as Kabbalah. Now, some people might say, well, you were just using Kabbalah as like a veil, to, to, but you really wanted to talk about codes. No. You have to understand, where I live at here, there is a rabbi who's a dear friend of mine. Uh, I consider him my Jewish rabbi because I am a member of the Chabad organization and I do attend from time to time uh, the shul there or the synagogue there. And we had recently, I say we because it is part of that group there, had a increase on the Kabbalah teachings. Now, the rabbi that I know is not into mysticism, but... He's a very joyful person, and he's always searching Kabbalah, trying to find the good in everything. And, um, but they, even be, they added an extra class. And so this was really troubling me that this was happening. And then um, secondly, I, I had noticed uh, that not just, not, not, you have to understand, this was not because of Brother Chris nor Brother Matthew, 
because even though Brother Chris shares his codes uh, with me and, and shared them on my Facebook page there, uh, and I did enjoy it. I would look at them from time to time. I didn't get to see all of them because my mind is always dealing with Israel and trying to determine if God is wanting to reveal something that would reveal who the Messiah is. That's just what God deals with me on, is that little area there. But I, I was really uh, more so thinking as a whole. Uh, I know Rabbi Glazerson. I know that he does the codes. I, I know other people that do codes as well, um, besides Brother Chris and Brother Matthew. But Brother Chris and Brother Matthew were closer to me. But I had watched that there had become not so much just with the code searchers, but the people themselves that are interested in the codes and what is revealed by the codes. People, even people I know personally, had become really caught up into uh, basically following this to see what's going to be the future. What's the prediction for the future? And so my heart was concerned, and then the Spirit of God began to deal with me and convict me as well that this is not His provided way of doing this. And I picked this up from reading the Gospel there when I was reading recently in the book of Luke and seeing how God used His Word even with Israel. I mean, here Yeshua raises from the dead and Yeshua tells in a parable that Israel's not going to believe, though there be one raised from the dead. And he says, they have Moses and the prophets. And so it clearly let me know that God has a provided way in which he reveals himself. Now, when we begin to go back and examine the word of God, even, and, and I was not nearly as hard, by the way, in that video there is what the Lord laid on my heart. And some of those things I'm going to say tonight. Now, I know Brother Chris was tremendously offended by it. He took it very personal. Uh, Brother Matthew as well took it very personal. Uh, I, Besides the different comments that were placed on the video, which finally I just blocked the comments because it's just so much uh, that I didn't want to be distracted constantly with these comments, I reached out to both brothers. I called both of them three times, trying to get through to them. Uh, I did get their answering machine, so I thought the, the worst case scenario, at least maybe I can leave a message to express my heart to these brothers, seeing as they're not taking my call and they're not returning my call. I wanted to give it a full 24 hours for them to return my call, which they never did. Um, I did reach out through two other brothers that know them to try to reach out to them as well, to let them know you know, basically trying to follow a biblical mandate that if you've offended someone or they've offended you in this case here, because you have to understand that afterwards, Brother Matthew posted a video and as well, Brother Chris, even after I've tried to contact them, Brother Chris still posted another video uh, reprimanding me in his own way. Uh, Brother Matthew as well um, posted a video and a lot of things have been said. When I made this video here, though, I was not targeting these brothers, although because they do do codes, naturally, um, as Mama says, if the shoe fits, you wear it. So unfortunately, uh, because I was condemning the overemphasis that people are placing on codes. Now, this is not the code searchers themselves, but this is the codes themselves and how people are using this. That's what caused the offense. Uh, now, I do know that a little bit about the way they do their research. Not a lot, but I know a little bit about it. And when I say a little bit about it, I know that, for example, Brother Matthew spends a lot of time really trying to research before he uh, publishes something. Brother Chris publishes a little bit more often. But as far as their content of their codes and what they've researched, I was not and am not even now condemning what they researched because I don't know. Now, I do know for a fact, and I'm not saying this about brother, these two brothers here, but I know for a fact codes constantly fail or the interpretation that people place on the codes, they constantly fail. It's a very large margin of these things that happen. And I'm sure if you go and you research, you'll find out. Most of the time, though, the people that do the predictions with the codes that do fail, then those videos disappear because they don't want people knowing that they failed. I also know that the Jewish rabbis, including Rabbi Glazerson, have taken and they've put 
uh, in the codes that Jesus is a false prophet. And they're able to manipulate that to a way to where it comes out just that. But we know good and well that Yeshua is not a false prophet. They also put him as a reincarnated, reincarnated Esau. We know that's not true. So you have to begin to start saying if all this is quote unquote in the codes, are the codes really true or can they be manipulated? So the other thing that I was seeing, and this is because of my Jewish brethren, they are trying to find God, but they're not patient in doing so. They're not patient to wait for God to give them the Holy Spirit. And this is one reason why we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit tonight, that and Brother Chris uh, condemned me on some things that I've said about the Holy Spirit. So we're going to discuss these things tonight. But they're not patient to wait upon the Holy Spirit. And they're wanting that connection back with God. So the Jewish people are into Kabbalah and into the codes both. Why? They're trying to get an answer from God what is going to be. Now, I know that because of so much people are under, they understand that the mysticism in, in Kabbalah, so therefore people don't like the codes to be translated as the same. But one thing we have to understand, in the Hebrew uh, language, letters were the representations of numbers in, uh, originally. All right? And every number has a numeric value, we might say. Aleph is one, Beth is two, Gimel is three, et cetera. And it goes right on down and then goes into the large numbers, 20, 30, 40, et cetera, 50, and on down. Now, there is a numeric value for each one of those letters. Now, when the Kabbalah started, a rabbi takes and he basically has assigned what the meaning is for the numeric value. And this is where everything went wrong. Because, see, there's no doubt that maybe God does have something hidden in a numeric value. But nowhere in the Torah does God give us the permission to try to go and figure that out. It's the same thing with the Bible codes. There is no doubt some great things may be woven and hidden in the Bible code. But the thing is, is he never authorized us to go find these things out. He tells us, even, and this is what I know brothers are not going to like, but I'm going to tell you the truth. This is the way we've got, we've got to realize. I mean, Brother Gary, he put out a video today in support. He wanted to see reconciliation, but Brother Gary Lowry made it quite clear. And I, I shared it on our Facebook. It's also on my favorites in, in my YouTube channel, so you can watch the video yourself. But he spoke about these things. And he went across the board like I did, whether it's your dreams, whether it's divisions, whether it's uh, Bible codes, Kabbalah, any of these things here. He said, anything you place above God, you've turned it into a golden calf. And it's not God's provided way. So when I really begin to look at this, one of the things that concerned me, we have to go back and think about the story of Saul. And I know this is, this is very offensive. And brothers, you have to understand, I love you. I'm not trying to offend you. I'm trying to get, and this was the sole purpose of this video that I did the other day, God's way of revealing himself, is I'm trying to get our focus back on Christ. Not on me, not on you, not on our, our, the research or whatever we do, but to get our focus back on Christ. That's what this whole purpose is. You know, Saul was an anointed king of, of God, but he had backslid in his particular case. Now, I'm not saying you brothers are backslid. Please don't, don't interpret what I'm saying. All right? Even like, Brother Chris, I know you said that just because I put in the statement there, what is that Israel more and more turned to Kabbalah and even the Bible because there is an answer and it is because they don't have the Spirit of God leading them to know Him. And for him, Brother Chris said, I don't have to watch the video. It's just, you see what I'm saying? But you have to understand. Did God ever instruct us this? Now, I know that you quote, the, you quote a scripture that says that God hideth the matter and it's, it's up to the kings to, to search it out. I can't say that that applies in this case at all, but I, I understand, I appreciate that. But when Saul 
he, he takes and he goes to the witch of Endor. Why? Because he doesn't get an answer from God. He even tells, I mean, the witch of Endor brings up Samuel the prophet. Doesn't, I mean, she was able to bring up the truth right there. She brought Samuel the prophet up. Now, there's probably some people who say, it wasn't really Samuel. The Bible doesn't dispute the fact that she brought up Samuel the prophet. In fact, Samuel prophesies to Saul and says, you and your sons will be with me tomorrow. But he also says, because, because Samuel or Saul says to him, he says, you know, Samuel says, why have you disturbed, disturbed me from my rest? And he says, well, I can't get an answer from God. You know, he can't get the Urim of Thummim to answer. In other words, the Urim of Thummim, the, the, the Aaron's breastplate, if he says, you know, ask a question before the Lord, it doesn't have a supernatural, uh, um, where the stones light up. He said, the Lord doesn't speak to him in dreams nor in visions. The prophet doesn't have a word for him. So he's really, he's troubled in his heart and he's desperate to hear from God. So instead, he chooses to go to the witch of Endor to try to find something out. Well, it's not to say, I mean, it was wrong to do it. You know, I'm not saying that going to the Bible code or to, 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 to search out Bible codes is wrong. But what I'm trying to show you, though, is even in the case of Saul, there is a provided way. And he clearly had said he couldn't get the answer. So he chose a secondary means to try to get the answer. That's why even we're commanded not to use mediums or anything like that. You know, what, like Brother Gary said in his video, God wants us to be in prayer. You know, he wants us to, to fast and to pray and to seek him. God says, if you draw nigh to me, I will draw nigh to you. And I guarantee you, that there's been times in my life that the more I drew nigh to him and was reading my Bible and praying, then the supernatural would happen and he would foreshow fore things that would happen and that everyone would happen just right. Now, I can't say, though, that I've, I've had dreams before, too, like you guys, and I, and I thought, gosh, this, I wonder if this is prophetic. But I've always tried to keep a balance and I've always been very cautious in saying anything about a dream. And if I did, I always tell the people, and this was before I ever began to speak publicly, I would say to the people, you know, look, I, I don't know. I just say it to you as a witness. Just like when I was criticized about praying for the rain in Israel. Do you know when I do stuff like that, I do make it a point to tell at least two witnesses that I did so and so. You know why? Because I'm not interested in trying to be somebody. I'm just, I, I knew in my heart, I prayed a simple prayer. I didn't know that God was going to answer the prayer. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just asking a humble little thing. You know, Lord, the, the nature here needs rain. He didn't have to answer it. But beautifully, he did, and I thank God for it. But I, I get criticized for that. Now, let me, let me just, this go into something, though, that I, that's very serious, though, that was, and, and many of you guys may not even know this, because I know you've not seen the videos that Brother Matthew did, uh, or Brother Chris. I say videos. Only, Brother Matthew only did one video. Um, but Brother Matthew had stated in one of the videos that I came to him uh, and I had told him that I believed that I was one of the two witnesses that's spoken of of Revelation. And I asked him to look, to search that out in the Bible codes. And I know that in the chats that they're doing privately and stuff, a lot of this is circulating around. Brother Gary made a very interesting comment to me. And I'm going to straighten out what was actually said so you'll know the truth about it. Because I hate to even have to bring this before you guys publicly to begin with. But it's important that I straighten out the slight of turn in what was said about me. But I'm going to straighten it out, and I guarantee you, I do have witnesses on this, because there's only four people that I can tell you about that I've shared uh, these private things that know me that you guys would possibly know as well. When I first met Brother Matthew, 
I did share with him in confidence several things that had happened to me in life that made me wonder what God had called me for. I'd shared with him how that about 10 years ago when I was praying before the Lord, I, I was living in Israel at the time and I was seeking God to know how would I ever be able to speak to the Jewish people, which I had felt in my heart, he wanted me to talk to my own people. But how could I speak to them unless I knew the Hebrew language? This has nothing to do with thinking I'm a witness or nothing like that. I wanted to be, I wanted to testify to the Jewish people because they are my kindred. I have DNA tests that proves all of that. I have DNA tests that shows that I'm actually from the Levite family. I thought it was just the tribe of Ephraim, but I'm from the Levite family as well. I never knew that. But the thing was, is I wanted to be able to speak to them in the Hebrew language. And I had studied Hebrew for years, but I have a trouble with dyslexia. So therefore, I have a struggle with learning and perfecting in a, in a foreign language. And so in prayer, I had gone before the Lord after years of praying about this. And I said, Lord, I don't know how to speak. I can't get this, what do, how, would, can you show me something that will help me to know that you're going to help me with this language? And I said, God, I hate to open a Bible and just look to see an answer for that. I said, but God, I'm desperate to hear from, hear from you because you're just not answering me and I don't understand. And so I took it, I said, God, I'll, I'm going to open the Bible and would you show me an answer that would speak to my heart. And when I did, I opened up into the book of Exodus and my finger, I put my finger down and then as I opened my eyes, and I hate doing that, I think that's wrong to do that, but I was just desperate to hear from God. And God knows my heart. I'd, I'd asked him for years, but he wouldn't reveal anything to me. And I put my finger on the very verse that read, I will be with your mouth and I will teach you what you will say. And this is where Moses was complaining to God that he couldn't speak well. And so God was answering him. And, and it blessed my heart. And it didn't make me think that I'm somebody. But years later, I had someone run in, a, in, the, in the Bible code. Wasn't Brother Chris, wasn't Brother Matthew, just ran my name. Rabbi Glazerson laser, later confirmed that it was true. He said, your name is actually 32 times in the book of Exodus. Well, the odd thing is that it skips space of 17. My name fell right in that verse. Danun was written in the Bible code in that verse there. Down through my life, I've had a lot of supernatural things happen. I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face several times, and the things that he's told me that would happen always happened. I have actually heard, an, heard the audible voice of the Lord on many occasions. But one specific occasion, he told me to read Isaiah 61. I spent the next 15 years, probably closer to 20 years, praying, seeking him. Why did he have me read that? Now, if you read Isaiah 61, it's the redemption of Israel. But the thing is, is God didn't tell me why he had me read it. So I'm not the type of person to go and inject something into it. I've also had on several occasions... And I'm not going to go into the specifics of this, but I have gone into the specifics with those that I had spoken in confidence to about things that were troubling me in my life. But total strangers that didn't know me, first time ever running into these people, had come up and prophesied of things that would happen in, in my future. It bothered me because what they were prophesying with, I didn't want to have anything to do with. And so I shared some of these things, more so with Brother Chris. Brother Matthew, only one time I spoke to him about this. And the only thing that I asked is said, I, I said, I'm trying to get an answer to see, is, is there something that God has called me for that I don't understand? Now, I never said, Oh, I believe I'm one of them. That is not true. But I have said, if there is a possibility that this is what he's called me for, I'd like to try to know. 
Now, Brother Chris was the one that actually ran most of the codes. And, of course, one, and you can see part of that here, was the one that struck the most. But every one of these brothers, if they will be honest with you, and even the ones that are not against me will tell you the same, to this day, and I've never changed my opinion on this, and that is, I said to Brother Chris, I can't say if I said this to Brother Matthew or not, because the code had not been done by him at that time, but I said to Brother Chris, I said, I appreciate that you did this for me. I said, but you have to understand. I said, I, I cannot believe it, and I cannot accept it. I don't, and I know that Brother Chris was not trying to interpret this code to me. But the thing is, is I refused to accept what a code said. I, had, I could not accept what things have been prophesied about me through the years. You know, and I did say, I appreciate these things. I mean, at least it kind of tells me, or at least I, I kind of get an idea of what could be. But I said, you don't understand. Unless God himself reveals to me what he's called me for, I can't accept any of these things. I said, I can't accept a Bible code. I can't accept these prophecies that have been prophesied over me for all these years. And it's happened many more times since the, the three times that it happened earlier in life. You know, I said, but he, if God has called me for any purpose, I said, then he himself will have to come and reveal that to me. I said, otherwise I won't believe it and I won't accept it. And any time anyone has ever asked me, because you guys may not realize this, it's been posted even in comments. I've had so many emails, people saying, I believe you're one of the witnesses. I believe you're one of the witnesses. I believe you're one of the witnesses. And I write back, no, sir, I'm not. Or no, ma'am, I'm not. I'm just your brother. Because you see, I am nobody. I know that. I'm not anybody. I've got a passion for my people that if I can win some to Christ, that's my desire. I don't know how God has got in his plan as far as the two witnesses and how he's going to do it. For all I know, it's the literal Moses and Elijah that are coming back. But I know that there's different ways that this could be. And I don't know the answers to it. And that's why I've always maintained I'm not. But the sad thing is, though, is... It's been made to look like now, from this video now that's circulating on the internet, that I am puffed up in my mind and I have let this go to my head and I am trying to declare to the world that I'm one of the witnesses. And that is the furthest from the truth. And anyone, you could talk to Brother Jason Egroff, Brother Gary Lowry, they would confirm it. If Brother Chris and Brother Matthew, which I, like I said, I didn't discuss this enough with Brother Matthew. We really only talked one time personally. But Brother Chris, if he would be honest enough, he would tell you the same thing. I'll always maintain that same posture. Because I don't know. I don't know anything. In fact, I don't want anything to do with it, period. You know, I had these things that went on in my heart and I wanted to try to get to an answer to it, to try to get a consolation. But then on top of it, though, and this is when I felt like codes were, it was okay, it was no big deal, you know. But then God began to deal with me that this is not the way to go about His Word. That I was, in this case here, I was doing just like Saul. I'm trying to get an answer to try to find out what's supposed to happen in my future and everything, but I was going about it in the wrong way. So I thank God, though, that at least in my heart, He's dealt with me in a humble way not to try to be someone I'm not. And so even to this day, I do not claim to be one of the witnesses. I have no idea what God, what His purpose in life is for me. I don't know. But the thing is, is what I do know, though, is the way he's revealed to me about the Messiah and the identity of the Messiah that is hidden in the Torah and in the prophets, I do believe that this has an impact. I know it has an impact on Jewish people because by God's grace, I've actually had the privilege of leading Jewish people to Christ. It's not been in some great big volumes, no. But every so often, I've had that privilege to be a part 
And normally it's because I'll be called and I'll get to go personally speak to them and in depth. And that's normally what I do is the things that God has revealed to me that identify the Messiah. I share this with them. And Brother Gary Skagibo is a testimony to that. He is a witness to that because a dear friend of his that he grew up with, a Jewish lady that had never believed in the Messiah, flew down here to Fort Myers and he had me go and speak with her. And after speaking with her at great depth, she sent me a letter shortly thereafter that she gave her heart to Yeshua. So I thank God for all these things here. Now, let me go into another issue here. And um, let me just say this here to those of you that, that, that save the videos or if you have the ability to copy these videos, you may want to save this, especially for sisters, and, as, and, and, I'm, and I'm saying for brothers as well. This is going to be another controversial subject. And because I know uh, Brother Chris had, when he published his video about me as well, he spoke about me speaking about the Holy Spirit being feminine and that I'd spoken to him in private about this here. Um, and he goes in there to, to bring out what he believes is right. Uh, basically, he, he, I guess Brother Chris doesn't realize that I've spoken publicly about this. Uh, I can't tell you which videos it's on, but I have spoke about this before. It's not something, some little mysterious thing that I only spoke to Brother Chris about. And uh, he's hoping that everybody will say, oh my gosh, Steve is so taboo and, and demon-possessed and and all this, and then up and just bail out. Um, so we're going to go into that. And what we have to do, though, in order to be able to bring this out, is we're going to look at Genesis, and we're going to look at the fall in the garden, as well as the creation, uh, to bring out uh, some of these truths here. And I think it's very important, because what happens, and this is one of the reasons why you never see much mentioned about uh, the Hebrew word ruach, which is the word for spirit, uh, that there, the word ruach to begin with is a feminine word. Uh, and that is a little bit hard for people to take. So let me kind of, let's, let's start off first by, I want to I wanna set the stage for you. And then we're going to look at this biblically so you can see where I'm coming from on this. God, we know, is masculine. There's no question about that. Uh, he came in the form of his son, Yeshua. Again, masculine. But the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh, that is imparted from God for His bride is feminine. And this is one of the reasons why the word in the, in the Hebrew language is actually feminine. Many Hebraic scholars, and as well there are some Christian scholars, know that that is true. You cannot hide it. Um, you may be able to, to try to, and, and, it's, and the main reasons why this is hidden is because there is a patriarchal system where men are so desirous to dominate women. And this is why you see that. Now, in the Hebrew language and in the Aramaic language, the word ruach, or for the word spirit, is a feminine word. In the Greek language, it is neutral. It is, neither, it is not gender specific. It is not he nor she. But when they translated the Bible into Latin, the Latin language puts the word spirit in a masculine. Now, of course, this was done by the Romans, uh, the Latin language, and this is why it's done in a masculine. And the reason being is because of that domination. Um, and I could really take you deep into that, and many people may not like that, but the thing is, is you have to remember, Satan wants to be worshipped. And the, I've, I've said before, the only way Satan is going to be worshipped is if he can get you to believe that there's three separate gods. Well, that's why Satan doesn't want you to know the feminine side or the feminine attribute of the word ruach or the word spirit, because that's where he would be worshipped at. He wants to be God on earth. So, now that's a little deep there, but, but let me just, let's just back up a little bit so you'll understand what's going on. Now, let me take you to Genesis, 
And this is where I'm going to start this for you as. Um, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to go to verse 2. I'll just read from verse 1. Bereshit bara Elohim et shemaim ve'et ha'aretz. Now, for grammatical lesson so you can understand here. Bereshit means at the first. Bara is created. Elohim is the word God in the Hebrew language. Now, oddly enough, most people because of the yod mem, the suffix on the word there, the ending of the, the two letters that end the word for God there, it is pluralized. So most people automatically say, well, there's more than one God as a result of that. Uh, now some, I know you have to understand there's two different ways that the Trinity is explained. One, sometimes people use it like an egg. They say there's a shell, there's the white part, and then there's the yellow part, the yolk. Uh, but they say the three make one. I think that's a very poor analogy because it's actually three distinct different parts of an egg. Um, water is another example and I think water is better because even God refers to himself as the waters of life but the reason why I think water is better because water is still the same no matter which way you do it's not a shell it's not a yolk and it's not the little white stuff inside an egg but if you take water and you heat it it becomes steam but that steam in the air is still the water it's just now in a vapor form but water in its own compound in the liquid form is still water. If you freeze it, it becomes a solid, but it's still water. It doesn't change its principle, but it has three ways in which that water can manifest itself. It can be manifested in steam and move around like a vapor, almost like a spirit. It can be frozen, a solid, rock hard, and it can also just become a liquid. So I think that's a little bit better way if you're trying to describe that as, as far as how that is. But here's the reason why we know that there's not multiple gods in this case is because the word in front of Elohim, the verb, the bara, which means created, bara Elohim, bara is a singular. And in Hebrew, if it would have been multiple gods, it would have to be a plural verb with the noun being plural as well. And Hebrew is like that. The same thing in gender if it's a, if the noun is masculine, if it's speaking about God and it speaks of Him uh, and something about Him, it's going to put the verb in the feminine, or excuse me, in the masculine as well when it's speaking of God or if you're speaking uh, any particular noun, um, if you're speaking of a woman doing something in the Bible, then whatever she's doing, like the word ose means to do, but if she's doing it, then it's taosa, okay? Uh, she, the woman, you know, or let's say Eve, Eve ta'osa, which is not literally the way the Bible is written there. I'm just giving you an example. You have that in there, the tav in there, denoting the fact that it is a woman, so it has to be the feminine form, whereas yaose would be for the man. He and the tav in there makes it a she. So same thing in the verb uh, here, bara Elohim. So it literally tells us that there was only one God there that was doing the creating. It wasn't the Father and the Son sitting side by side as some people suggest because clearly the Bible in one place says that everything was created for Him and by Him as far as Jesus was doing the creating. Another place the scripture says that God Himself, Hashem, did the creation. Uh, so it becomes confusing where they sitting there together, as many people suggest. Well, according to the Hebrew language here, no, there was only one God there present during the creating. The Elohim, the reason why it's plural, it denotes the fact that God of what form he is in at that present time. Is he God in heaven or is he God here? In this case here, he's God on earth. But now we're going to find out what form he's in. He says, Et HaShemaim, so God created the heavens, the Et HaArts, and the earth. Okay, and when the earth was uh, was very in, uh, astonishingly empty, and darkness was upon the surface of the deep. Okay, now here comes the important part. Now we're going to hear for the first time about the spirit. Okay, the spirit Elohim of God. 
You know, and there's some people translate that the presence, but it's the Spirit of God. Merchafet alpen nehamayim hovered over or upon the surface of the waters. Now the word hovered here, machafet, ending in the tav, clearly is a feminine verb. So in this case here, veruach elohim machafet alpen the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and it is a feminine verb. It, in other words, God, like a mother, is hovering over the earth. Now, he doesn't mean that God is a woman. But what is he doing? He's creating. He's bringing forth life. And every life that is on this earth is from his life. And we see that clearly in the scripture. Because it's always high. That's God's life. So when God is hovering over the earth, His Spirit is hovering here, and it's denoted in a feminine. Why? Because He is bringing His life to be imparted on the earth in the different life forms that He's putting here. He's putting a, a part of Himself that gives the trees life, the animals life, etc. Now man is different because it's an intimate creation that He makes with man. But Anyway, it's referred to in the feminine here for a specific purpose. Now, when we come down to Adam and Eve, and God creates Adam, first the man, he makes the man, and the Bible says he created them, male and female created he them. So in the very beginning, when God forms Adam and Eve, they're one unit. In fact, when he breathes into, into his nostrils, the breath, nishmat, is the breath, chayim, the breath of life, into Adam's nostrils. He breathes his own life, chay, being the word life, the yod in there being God's life, Hashem's life, in a plural form, into the nostrils of Adam. The nishmat is the word breath. God breathes that, his breath of his life, into the nostrils of that clay figure that he has made. And he does it in a plural form. Why? Because Eve is part of that creation already. And God knows that she's in there, so therefore he breathes it thus. Now, his spirit is the ruach that he places inside of Adam and Eve. That's what he's putting inside of them is his own spirit. And see, why? This is one of the main reasons why we see that the Spirit of God is a feminine word. It's not that God is a girl. But like Adam, at one time Eve was inside of Adam. And God taken Eve from the man. Mean ish, the, script, the, the, the Hebrew language says. The scripture says, God taken uh, isha, mean ish, from the man, or in this case, as I've mentioned to you before, the word ish literally is two compounded words. Ish, and in the middle of the word ish, Aleph Yod Shin, is the Yod, which is the first letter of the divine name of God. So we know that it is the fire of God, or the Ruach. It is the Holy Spirit that is within inside of this man. And he takes Isha, Aleph Shin He, that's how you spell her name, Isha from the ish from the Spirit of God basically is the way you would look at that. From there, the feminine, in fact, what's interesting, the isha is the feminine attribute that's inside, and maybe the word attribute is not a good word, but in other words, the feminine life of God that was inside of Adam is brought out to make Eve. Now, we, we see nowhere in Scripture where God has to nishmat, breathe, Chaim or Chai into Eve's nostrils. Why? She's already filled with the Spirit of God. So there's no need for this. Now, the tree of life, the eighth Chaim, was in the garden so that when the children of Adam and Eve would be born, they would be able to partake of the tree of life and live. Now, they, we do know for a fact, though, 
It's interesting because God does make the statement later when he has to put the cherubims there to guard the way of the tree of life. He said, lest they put forth their hand and take and live forever. But originally there was no partaking. God was giving. So the tree of life was something that God gave out. It wasn't something that you went and got on your own. But we know in the story here, though, a fall comes. And this is something that's important as well, especially when we're dealing with the Spirit of God, uh, the Ruach. And so I want to deal with this issue a little bit. And sisters, I think this will be a blessing for you. Um, and brethren, it may be something that you may do really seriously need to prayerfully look at uh, because women have been put down for far too long. And I'm afraid this is one of the reasons why. And, and let me say this here too. I know when Brother Chris did the video, his video there in condemning me about the Ruach being the Holy Spirit as far as a feminine characteristic there, um, I have to realize too, though, you know, he maybe just does not understand it. And, and that's okay. I mean, you know, God's got to reveal things. I'm, I'm not God. I can't reveal it. Uh, but even after this video here, he, may, he still may not believe it. I, I don't know. I, I, can't, I can't say that. Uh, I don't think God's going to condemn you if, you if you don't see this. But I think, though, you will find that when you hear the whole matter of this, it will also better help you to understand God's way of doing things. And because what we're talking about when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, this is redemption. This is the way God is restoring man in his relationship back to God. This is the whole reason for the video the other day, God's way, God's way of revealing himself, because God desires to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with us. His relationship that he wants. The Bible, does not the Bible say that in the last days, I will make myself known to them in dreams and visions. Your young men shall see dreams and your, or, or maybe I got this wrong, the old men shall see dreams and your young men shall have visions. And upon my handmaidens, I will pour out my spirit. You see what I'm saying? This is God's provided way. But we're not seeking God for His way of making these things known. And a lot of it has to do with just scrupled up theology. And so I want to try to help straighten some of this out for you. When the fall takes place, let me just share with you a little bit here. Um, okay, here. The Yomed uh, Hashem Elohim, and, and God, He says, La Isha, Mazot Asit, uh, to the woman, uh, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, uh, and the woman said, He deceived me, and I, and I did eat. The Yomer Adonai Elohim El Chanachash and the Lord God says to the serpent, Ki asit zot aro, ata makol chabahame, excuse me, chabahayma. See, he says, because you have done this, you're, you're cursed, you're cursed uh, more than the cattle. Umekal chayat, and, and then any beast, uh, Hasadea al ha chanecha more of any of the beasts of the field and upon your belly talecha uh, and dust shall you eat kol yamim chayacha all the days of your life. Now, uh, rather than reading every single little thing to you in Hebrew, let me move forward a little bit faster for you here. Then he says uh, enmity shall I put between you and between the woman. Now, the word enmity, which is uh, eva, is hatred. It, God is putting hatred. He says, enmity shall I put between you and between the woman. And between your offspring and between her offspring. So God is establishing 
He's, you know, he, and it's not so much that God is, is, this is not that God is ordaining something. God is now prophesying of the events that are going to unfold. God says that there's going to be hatred between the woman and the serpent. Now, it's interesting that there's going to be hatred between the woman and the serpent because God hates the serpent as well, or Satan in this case here, because we know it was Satan that got into the serpent and caused all these evils to happen. But he says he's going to put hatred or enmity between him and the woman and between her offspring, uh, between the serpent's offspring, your offspring, and between her offspring or her seed. Actually, the words, it's zara seed. Uven zara zarache, zaracha, uven zara. Okay, between your seed and her seed. So now he's prophesying of the coming of the Messiah. Now notice, you know, it's funny. You remember how the Bible says about Israel? It says, uh, there's one place in there where it says, uh, your enemies will be my, or no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm thinking of Ruth, actually. Ruth is speaking to, to Naomi, and she says, your God will be my God, you know. Where you live, I will live. Where you die, I will die. There's other places we see in the scriptures, your enemies will be my enemies. So when God says to Eve, or to, he's speaking to the serpent here, that he'll put hatred between the serpent and her, she becomes an enemy of the devil. Well, she, in other words, she's on the same side as God. God's an enemy of the devil as well. Then he says that she's going to have a child. And the child is going, Satan's children, is going to hate the woman's child. All right? Now, watch closely. He says, he will crush your head, and you will bruise his heel, or bite his heel. Then he says here, ha, uh, al -isha, ha -isha, and to the woman, Omar, he said, and literally it doesn't say the word he said, by the way. It just says said. To the woman said, Haraba Arabe, or Araba. Now most people translate that as, I will greatly increase your sorrow. Well, I didn't put the word sorrow in there yet. Esvanecha or your suffering. But there could be a trouble or there could be a problem with translating that as I will greatly increase. But I need to show you why before I tell you the way that could be. And typically it's translated, I will greatly increase your sufferings and your childbearing and pain. Shall you bear children and yet for your husband shall you be, shall you be craving. That's normally how they translate that. Now, I'm, not actually, I'm actually looking at this in Hebrew, so I have to kind of bear with me a little bit on this here. I know if you're looking at, um, let, let me real quick, for the sake of those that are like going like, brother, my God, what in the world are you reading? Let me read this to you from King James. So it makes it a little bit clearer. I'm in Gmail, which is chapter 3. And Genesis, so let's go to this, and we are verse 16. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. This is what most people think that the verses actually mean. Now there is a lot of Hebrew scholars that know this is not so. And ironically, the Lord dealt with me a little while back on this and began to reveal to me that, yes, indeed, um, not knowing that other scholars had been doing work on this. In fact, some scholars have even been kind of taken back a little bit because by God's grace, he's revealed these things to me. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I'm able to see that it's actually prophetic and it's not what people think it is. Okay, so in Hebrew here, Haraba Arabe, Etzvanecha, Vecha Chernecha, 
בעצב, תלדי בנים ואל אישך תשותיך וכו' וימשל בך. אוקיי, let me show you some breakdowns here though to make this simpler. I know it's a little complicated getting to all this. When God says here, תלדי בנים, he actually is saying to her, you will, he's prophesying, God is prophesying and telling, uh, telling Eve, you will birth sons. Okay? But another key factor in here, he says, ואל uh, אישך, and for your husband, תושותיך, he actually says, and you will turn to your husband. And this is one of the things that I had caught long ago. And only to find out in my research after I caught this here, that there are many scholars, and, and, and some of the older Bible translations uh, to English way back, you find out that they do also translate this as being that she turns to her husband. Now that told me immediately that Eve actually had her own relationship with God. So when she was arguing with the serpent and saying, God has said, she's not speaking of her own accord. I mean, there's a lot of people that condemn her, both Christian ministers and rabbis, and say she did wrong because she was saying that God said when God never said nothing to her, he spoke to her husband Adam. That's a lie. Because had she done wrong herself and lied and said something that God did not say to her, God would have addressed it right here in her condemnation and would have charged her for lying as well. But he never charges her for lying. So if we find out that that's not right, what else is not right about this? It's interesting how things get scrupled up in translations. Now he does say, Vehu Yemashal Becha, and he shall rule over you. Of course. That's only obvious. Why? He loses the Holy Spirit as well as a result of the fall. Because why? Adam willfully sinned. The Bible clearly says, and I forget how many times throughout the scriptures, it clearly puts the blame on the man. But ironically, in the Christian community, as well as in the Jewish community, all the blame is put on Eve, like she was the bad guy. But nowhere in Scripture does God ever do anything but put the blame upon the man. Well, let's look at the words here then, and let's see then. If we know then that she's going to turn to her husband because she's lost her relationship with God, we know that God has prophesied she's going to birth sons, Okay, let's back up and let's look at the part where it speaks about, and let me just look at this for you over here in the English language so I don't mess up the wording for you guys. Let me get back to verse 16, I believe it is. And in sorrow, and we have on here, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Well, here's, here's problem number one. The word... Um, for conception. Let me, let me get you to it here real quick. Hang on one second. It's vecharnecha. It's totally misspelled. Now, you might say, wait a minute. <laughs> you telling me that that is, that, that is a misspelled word? No, I don't think that it's misspelled intentionally. I think it's mistranslated because the word that we actually use in, in, uh, the, in, in, in the word conception has two more letters than what this has. It has a yod and a vav in it as well. And that's why I say it's not spelled correctly. Now, I'm not just saying this on my own. Even scholars, there are scholars that have recognized this as well. If you go to the book of Ruth, and I believe that's right, the book of Ruth, let me just double check that for you. Uh, in the book of Ruth, in chapter 4, uh, we have here the word, uh, where, where God says to Ruth here, "Ve'yatan Adonai Yahweh lecha ha ve'yavon ve'taled ben, and you shall conceive and bear a son." Now, I know you guys don't understand this part here if you don't speak Hebrew, but let me just spell it for you. In this case here, the word. For the word conception is hey resh yod vav nun. Now, 
the root of the word is actually Heresh Nun in the way they spelled it in Genesis. But the correct way to spell it is Heresh Yod Vav Nun. In Hebrew, though, it is not uncommon for the Vav to be an added letter for a vowel because it is a vowel. But the Yod in this case stands as a consonant. In any other place that you will find the word conceive in the Hebrew scriptures is always spelled according to the way it's spelled in the book of Ruth. So when we begin to look then at this word here that is in Genesis, we find out that it doesn't mean or translate out as conception. But instead, it's, it translates as the word as sighing or um, how else could I put it? Like, like um, it's a heaviness is what it is. The same thing for the word that they translate for pain, Beitzav. Literally in Hebrew, what this word means is in grief. You can go through the, through, the, through the whole Tanakh and you will find the same word here is always translated for the word grief. So if in this case here, now, and I'm breaking this down slowly for you so it'll make sense for you. So let's go back to the English version here, version for you. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. And in thy, what? In thy sighing and in thy grief shall you birth sons. Again, he's prophesying that she's going to have sons, not children, sons. But basically, he's also prophesying that it's going to cause her grief and sorrow. Now, I've mentioned this to you before, but I learned a new one that I did not know before, and that is the word for greatly. Now, in Hebrew, if we put two words spelled the same back to back, in this case here, Rabbah, which is many, are great. But if you put them together, Rabbah, Rabbah, it would be greatly. But ironically, though, the word is kind of spelled a little different. We have the He, Rabbah, Arabe. So it's translated, I will greatly increase your sufferings. But the ironic thing, though, is it doesn't seem to go along with what the other words were. So if you begin, and this is something else that scholars have also picked up on, the Arab, the second word in there, Arab, Aleph Resh Bet, it's kind of funny, the Arab part, it literally means ambush. So what do we really have written right here by God? So we have El Chaisha Omar, and to the woman it was said. The one who the, the, the one the, the great the great ambusher will cause you great suffering and sighing and in great pain of the birthing of your sons. Probably the best way, and I wrote this down from where scholars have written this as well, and this is the way they translate it themselves. I'm just kind of translating it from you from a literal standpoint. And to the woman he said, A snare hath increased thy sorrow, and you shall bring forth sons. So we get a completely different picture of what happens to Eve. And as I also said to you, she turns to her husband. Why? Because she loses the spirit of God that she once had. Now, uh, which that reminds me, I still have, we still got to get back to another issue here in a minute about the Holy Spirit. So the thing is, is the Holy Spirit is lost and redemption has got to set in motion. God has got to redeem his creation because now his creation is lost. And so God goes to work upon that. Now, I was sharing with a brother on the phone here about the Holy Spirit when I was being criticized for making the statement about the Holy Spirit being feminish. And as I said to you, both in the Hebra Hebraic language as well as the uh, Arabic language, the word ruach is a feminine word. Okay? 
Now, we know God is masculine. I'm not trying to say that God is not masculine. Uh, a lot of times we look at, we say the Holy Ghost, and, and I know that people say, well, the Holy Ghost, He's the one that comes and, and does the comforting of us. There again, you're beginning to break and you're beginning to have three different gods when you're doing this. You're putting God as one God, Yeshua as another God, and the Holy Spirit as another God. The Holy Spirit is what God brought to impart into us. When Yeshua said, I will not leave you comfortless, but I will come and I will abide with you, even in you. That's where he's able to restore the life of God with inside of us. You see, if it makes sense to say it like this here, Eve was inside of Adam, and God taken Eve outside of Adam so Adam could have fellowship with his wife. She was the feminine part now, it didn't make Adam feminine, but when they were together, there was a feminine characteristic or a feminine quality that was inside of Adam. But not just a quality, it was his wife was in there. She wasn't just a quality, she was his wife that needed to be separated from him in order for them to have the right type of union so that they could be in love with each other. When Yeshua come on the earth, he was the masculine. He was God himself in a human body. But inside of him was the Holy Ghost. The very Spirit of God that he could impart upon each one of us. And that Spirit, that Ruach HaKodesh, was able to come inside of us when he died and that Spirit of God was released that was inside of him so that it could come upon us so that we could have a connection to him. You see, Adam, I mean, excuse me, Yeshua is the second Adam. No wonder why everything that happens to Yeshua is just like it was with Adam. You know, Adam was put into a deep sleep in order to bring forth his bride. His side was opened up. His wife was brought from there. And God created a body for her. And she was filled with the Spirit of Almighty God without any breathing having to be done. No nishmat, no breath of life was breathed in her nostrils because she was filled with the Holy Ghost. All right? Now, the same thing when Yeshua come. You have to remember, Adam and Eve's children, they were all born on the earth but the way of the tree of life was being guarded now. That Spirit of God that was going to be imparted out to each one of us was now guarded. See? When God, when the Ruach was hovering over the face of the waters, Ruach Elohim, it was Yeshua that was there back in the Garden of Eden. He was the tree of life. He was the one that had been brooding over the face of the earth. You see, and this is why Yeshua even says, uh, like a mother to us. That doesn't make him feminine. But the thing is, is he's going to put his spirit in us to be able to complete the union. God's not coming to marry a man. Do you not get that? I mean, that's the part that, that, so you understand why that the Spirit of God is referred to as a, in the masculine form in the Hebrew language is because that's the part of His life He imparts to us so that we can have a relationship with Him. God has a bride. He didn't, He's not coming for a bridegroom. So the Spirit of God that He places inside of us, the Holy Ghost that He places inside of us, is the feminine characteristic so that He can have a relationship with a bride. He's not interested in a relationship with a man. And so even as a, as a physical man in nature that we are, we become the bride of Christ. We become the feminine part to Him so He fills us with the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, which is in a feminine word. Why? Because we're to have that relationship with God. Now, I'll show you in a prophecy written in the book of Job to prove it to be so. You don't get it in English because in the English language they don't give it out in gender. 
Job chapter 33, and by the way, this is not just in the book of Job. There's many places. I chose Job because Job is prophetic. It's a prophetic book. So I chose Job here. But many times, now there are places, don't get me wrong, there are places where the spirit, the ruach, has, um, uh, it'll have a verb or an adverb that is in the masculine. And every time you see it there, it's because it's referring to God in spirit form himself. And that's what I want to make sure you don't, you don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that, the, that God's, God, him as a spirit, is feminine. No, I don't say that at all. I'm talking about the portion of his life that he's imparting to come upon us. That part is feminine. That's why there's so many scriptures that speak of it in the feminine. It's not that God's a girl, by no means. But the thing is, while man has been in a fallen state, he's had the Spirit with him until he imparted it on Calvary to come back upon us. But there are scriptures also that speak of the Ruach in a masculine form. Why? Because the Spirit, God himself, is a spirit, and in that case, it is a masculine. But the part of the Ruach that comes upon his bride that he imparts to us, that is feminine. All right, let me prove to you this in uh, Job chapter 33. Let me back up to verse 1. However, I beg you, Job, listen to my words. Give ear to my statements. Behold, I have opened my mouth now. My tongue speaks with uh, excuse me, speaks with my palate, my pronouncement express the uprightness of my heart and the knowledge of my lips speaks clearly. The Spirit have, uh, of God has made me and a soul from the Almighty gives me life. Now, for the English reader, it don't make a bit of sense to you as far as gender. Let me read it to you the way it should be translated from the Hebrew language. Okay? The Spirit of God has made me. Ruach el asateini. See? The Spirit of God, she has made me. Alep shin tav. The tav clearly denotes a feminine quality. See? Why? What, what makes us? It's not that God himself is the masculine, but he's making this, this man how? It's because of the, the feminine attribute from God that he used to make the man. That's why the she part is in there. It's not that God is feminine. It's the fact that he's creating this person to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's why the Osetani it's got the tav in there. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not written in a masculine. Watch this what's next. U nishmat. And he breathed. Uh, Shaddai. See? He breathes a soul. Tachayni. Tachayni. Again, the Tav, the first letter in there, which is in the future tense. But literally, the Tav means she, or in this case, her life in me. You understand what he's saying here? This, it's a little deep to say it, because it's not that God is feminine, but he's prophesying about the fact that God See, a soul from the Almighty gives me life. This is literally prophesying of the fact that Yeshua will come and impart eternal life by allowing His Spirit, see, to come back upon them. But that part of the Spirit that's imparted is feminine. Why? Because God's not coming to marry a man. God's not interested in putting in you a masculine Spirit of God. God's not like that. This is why he has in life the man and the woman, the type of marriage. Because the man types God as far as the masculine side, and the wife types the feminine side, and the union is complete. But if you put two men together, you got perversion, you got homosexualism. 
God is coming for a bride. And that's why the Spirit of God that dwells within us is the feminine part. He's coming to marry us, and He's completed that union by imparting the Holy Ghost upon us. But yes, God also is a spirit. And when it comes to God Himself being a spirit, that part is masculine. And I would agree with that. That's because He's God. But the part of His Spirit that He imparts into us, that part is feminine. And this is why you see it written in the Word of God that way. Now, we don't, it's not translated that way, you know, and probably a lot to do because it would, you know, maybe it would stumble people to, to say, well, wow, gosh, what do you mean? What is this all about? No, because this is not about worshiping some goddess. No, it has nothing to do with that. This is the part of life that God is putting into you so that you can have a relationship with Him. Because why? He wants a wife. He's come because He's in love with us. And so therefore, He put in us the feminine quality of His own life. The life that He created for us. You understand what I'm saying now? I'm not talking about when the Bible refers to God Himself in spirit form dealing with us as children or something like that. That's God. That's why, that's why there's many scriptures too to speak of that in a masculine form. But see, God doesn't make a mistake in His Word. This is the original language is the way He wrote that. But anyway, I think it's important that you know these things too because so many times women get the short end of the stick. I hope that don't sound wrong. But they do. They're belittled. And yet, Eve had a relationship with God. Let me just share with this with you in closing so it'll make sense to you. Do you know Yeshua came to fix the problem that Adam created? He had to give his life in order for the life of God to be imparted once again. See, Adam had done right in the beginning when he allowed God to put him into a deep sleep and bring forth his bride, filled with the Spirit of God. But then they sinned. Eve was only deceived. In fact, God says, if a person knows not to do right and they make that mistake, it's not held against them as sin. Adam knowingly did what he did, and so therefore God holds him responsible. And that's why we see this in Scripture. We also find, though, that God was going to use a woman, according to this prophecy right here, to bring forth the promised son. Really, the one mistake that Eve made was she doubted God's word. So somewhere along the way, God had to have a woman that would believe His Word unconditionally. That's what Mary did. In fact, what Mary did when she believed God's Word, it brought forth a child in her womb, and it set in motion redemption. Her actions, totally, it, it restored the mistake that Eve made. Now, it doesn't restore the life, but see, the actions that Eve did, Eve doubted God's word, and that's what brought forth her being attacked by Satan the way he did. And in her doubt of God's word, the attack came and sin came. But God had to fix the problem. So he was looking for a woman that would believe his word and not doubt his word. And once he found one that would do that, which it was Mary, when she believed unconditionally, he was able to get the process of redemption going again. And he was able to place in her the promised seed. But in the case of Adam, there was no way a man could lay down his life and raise it up again. So there was no man on this earth that could fulfill the great, horrible sin that Adam committed himself. 
Only God himself could fix that problem. So God become our salvation. As the scripture clearly says in Isaiah 43, God has become our salvation. And so God himself became a man and then gave his life in order for the Holy Spirit to be released. This is what this is all about. It's about redemption. I trust this has been a blessing for you. Um, in closing, let me just say this as well. To Brother Chris and Brother Matthew, I trust that you'll understand why I said the things that I did. And also understand, at one time, I felt that codes were, was not a big deal to do or be a part of. And I'm not saying that you guys have to stop or that I have some biblical mandate that you should not do it. I'm not saying that at all. But I really feel in my heart that the Lord is not pleased with the way these things are being done. And I think the way that the reaction came to the video I made kind of attests to that as well. And I know there's a lot of things being said privately as well in the background that attest to that as well. When we do something, if it's of God, it should not cause anger and bitterness. And this is one reason why I've not been angry. I've not been angry a bit in the world, although the videos that were made about me afterwards. Because to me, I realize you're, you're my brother still. Both of you are. And I don't believe that it was you that, that, that would speak the way that it's been spoken against me. I believe that that was just Satan coming in you know, to do his damage. I trust, though, that somehow that God will reveal to your heart that my intention is merely to get people's focus on Christ and that we look to the ways that He promised that He was going to reveal Himself to us in these last days. And even for those that do dreams and visions that people have, check them with the Word of God. If it appears to be prophetic, be sure before we say that it's so, that it is so. If you guys only knew how many that do not come to pass, You'd understand why I say that this is so serious. We're living in too late of an hour, guys. Too late of an hour. I do love you guys. We're moving forward now. The Lord has been dealing with me about the book of Daniel that will just blow your mind away. Totally, completely different than I've ever thought about before. Um, you're going to see, uh, by God's grace, I hope to do a video tomorrow night on it. And by the way, the, the, the Pope's trip, that was another thing I kind of got kicked around about too. I never said that I was going to do a video about some kind of great mysteries about the Pope. The only thing I've said about the Pope was I wanted to update the people about the events that happened. I know everybody has already updated the world about it, about the things that happened on the Pope's trip. I'm not trying to prophesy anything about the Pope's trip. I just wanted to kind of update you on things the way we've seen it as far as in the newscast and things that he said. Uh, we will still do that. Unfortunately, we got distracted with all this nonsense over these video, over this video, uh, and the subsequent videos that came out afterwards. But um, my desire is to get right back into the Word tomorrow. I really want to share with you guys the things the Lord has been revealing to my heart about Daniel. Uh, again, like David being a type of Mashiach. Uh, uh, Joseph being a type of Mashiach, the Messiah, Yeshua, that is. Uh, now God is revealing in my heart how that Daniel's life incredibly prophesies of the Messiah uh, in ways I'd never thought about before. So I know it'll be a blessing for you, and I ask you to pray for me, pray for my family here. Um, and we thank you. We thank you for all that you guys do for us, uh, the support that you guys give to this ministry. We thank you for that as well. And I think you know from watching these videos here, uh, I try not to say anything that's going to tickle your ears. I realize I 
sometimes hurt people I don't mean to. But I have to say what I believe that God wants me to say. And I think in the last couple of days I've felt a lot like Jeremiah. So, uh, because I've not been liked very much for the things that I've said. But I do love you guys and uh, I trust that God will cause things to work out for His glory. And know one thing, I'm your brother.